My name is Kristen Bennett. I am a kindergarten through second grade reading intervention specialist for Graceville Elementary School in Santa Paula. I also just finished a term on the Instructional Quality Commission. So I served on the Language Arts Subject Matter Committee and I did get to help with writing the framework with editing and some of those things as well. And there's one very quick but important piece or, or little thing I need you to do. For this URL, this last one right here that looks like an L, it's really a capital I that does not have its hat and shoes on. So <laughs> it does not matter if it's capital or lowercase, but it does matter if it's the letter I. So you can either put the little hat and shoes on, you can put the little dot above it, but make sure you realize that is an I, not an L, or that URL is not going to be too helpful for you. That matters, huh? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Hallie, and uh, I'll have some more to say later. Thank you, and I'm Hallie Yop Slowick. I am with CSU Fullerton. As a faculty member there, I taught many years in kindergarten, first grade, and beyond, mostly in a bilingual setting. English Spanish. I also um, am co-director for the CSU's Center for the Advancement of Reading and I got the opportunity to do some writing on the framework. So I'm happy to have you all here today and uh, just comment very quickly. You have this in your handout throughout these slides. There is some reference to different documents. You know, CACCSS CCA, should be obvious to you all. ELA, ELD framework should be very apparent. This S FR stands for Foundational Skills Resource. It's the white paper that has been posted on the CDE website. This is the link, but if you just search for Foundational Skills White Paper or CDE White Paper Foundational Skills, you'll find it, but you do have the link there. But throughout this presentation, you'll see, you know, if we've borrowed a quote from this, that, that SFR stands for that, okay? Um, here are our session outcomes today as we were planning this together. One is simply to increase familiarity with the foundational skills. To increase the big target of today's entire uh, launch is to increase familiarity with the ELA, ELD framework and the accompanying white paper on the foundational skills. I'll tell you right now, the hope is to have additional white papers on each one of those key themes, meaning making, effective expression, language development, content knowledge. This was just the first one we did. It synthesizes and puts all in one spot the information about foundational skills. To explore some pertinent resources within the framework so you see what is there and to consider instructional implications for English learners and students who are having difficulties with um, reading acquisition. I will comment that this session is targeted on TK5, right? so with a large emphasis on primary grades. Uh, but before we begin, we thought we'd ask you a couple of questions. First, before you even respond to these, how many of you are classroom teachers? Okay, only a handful. Well, thank you for being here, hooray. How many of you are administrators at the site? Okay, thank you. How about literacy coaches? Other district level folks? Okay, thank you. Faculty from higher ed? Uh, publishers, I think some publishers are at today's session. Thanks for being here. This is, we want good materials from all of you folks, right? Uh, um, uh, other, right? Any other kinds of categories? And what are some of those others that I haven't said? Speech pathologist, other specialists, maybe reading specialists, reading teachers. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful for being here. Would you please think for a moment and um, be ready to kind of just offer some things? How familiar is your staff with the foundational skills? So that we get a sense of this is all tremendously new stuff. So you can respond from who you are or respond with, gee, my staff is going, whatever staff that means, right? My colleagues who teach grade one or my school level or our district. Uh, just in general, how many of you say they're quite familiar with these new foundational skills? Quite familiar. Okay, a couple. How many of you somewhat familiar? How many of you, okay, we're going to need a lot of work in really bringing people up to speed on foundational skills. Okay, and some of you are just not raising your hands at all because if I missed a category. <laughs> Very somewhat and little. Okay, or, or such a wide range, who knows, maybe is your response. 
In terms of the foundational skills, could we just hear a few shout outs? What are some areas of excellence? What do you think is being done well in your site, district, whatever your domain is? As a publisher, here's what we're doing well, right? As a, as a literacy coach, here are the pockets of excellence here in terms of specific skills, right? So, yes? Phonics. Phonics, done an area of excellence in her area. Phonemic awareness, an area of excellence. Any other areas that you say, okay, this is, we're doing well on this. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Did you have a hand up? It's not classroom instruction, but we're offering a lot more PD for our teachers to help them understand the foundation skills and how to teach them. Thank you. Making the uh, curriculum <laughs> systematic and explicit. Thank you. How about some areas that you think are in my area are in need of some more attention? Shout out any. The mystery of decoding? Mastery. Mastery or mystery, right? <laughs> For some of us, it's more of a mystery than it is a mastery. Yeah, OK. Thank you. I see a lot of head nods. The assessment of where there are. Great. What else? Struggling readers and closing the gap into having a prior school Great. The role uh, to give in primary language instruction in the context. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to tell you there's advice on all of that in the framework. And we are going to be tapping on many of those areas today. But of course, this is an hour and 15 minute big picture overview where we'll drop in some very specifics. We're also going to um, provide just a kind of quick look at and highlight some particular things about the, the standards and the foundational skills. And then in the last third of our session here, we're going to distribute more handouts that have specific text within the framework to think about, oh, OK, that idea is there. Oh, OK, this is what I want to share with my staff. OK, this is something I need to be thinking about. So we'll share some more theoretical research, you know, big picture. And then we'll share some handouts that have particular, very specific, practical advice. Oh, this kind of advice is in the framework regarding foundational skills. Oh, look what it says about dealing with multisyllabic words in the framework. And those are only just selected samples. There's a lot more in there as well. So the last third we'll be digging in deeper and we'll also have some time for questions and answers. We're just reminding you with this graphic that we spend a lot of time throughout the framework and certainly across all the sessions today talking about these five key themes and some other really pertinent areas like assessment, like leadership, like uh, equity, uh, equity and access, like ELA. Uh, designated and integrated ELD and so forth. This session is focusing, oh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> and they're all interrelated, right? We really can't treat any of them in isolation, any of them, including foundational skills. And I hope by the end of the session you were, are completely convinced of that if you're not already convinced of it. Today we're zooming in on foundational skills in this session. And I would like to share with you, remind all of us, and tell you what the framework says is the ultimate goal of the foundation, the ultimate goals of the foundational skills. I'm going to read it to rapidly and accurately recognize and decode printed words in meaningful connected text. So when you said they can do it in isolation, but they're not doing it in connected text. And to nearly effortlessly record ideas in print. These contribute to students' ability to independently engage with and use printed language for their own purposes. It's about being able to decode the messages that are represented by the symbol system, the alphabetic system. And it's also about being able to encode our ideas and information and wishes in, by using that same system. So it's both the decoding and the encoding. And so the point is about meaningful to be able to use it to gain meaning from text and to express meaning. So that's the ultimate goal. 
And the foundational skills play a key role in that, of course, of achieving that ultimate goal. Because, and it's critical to know they're not an end in and of themselves, right? This is not just about, oh, yay, my first graders mastered the foundational skills. All the rest of you teachers can take care of everything else because I've done this one, right? That's not what it is. It's not an end in and of themselves. There needs to be that connection for the reason for it. I also need to add that we do know that, in fact, even though some kids struggle with those foundational skills, that comprehension is often a bigger problem for that, that we face as an educational community, especially as we go up the, up the years. There are kids who can decode well but can't construct meaning, right? Can't make meaning, can't gain meaning, can't construct it, can't put it themselves. And that, in fact, these other issues play really critical roles in being able to make meaning. So it's the foundational skills are important means, but they're not the end, that some of these other things even play more significant roles as we move up the grade levels in particular. And thus we conclude that foundational skills are necessary, but by no means sufficient condition for literacy development. I thought we would share with you very quickly what the position of the framework is on the foundational skills. What position is California taking? Because in fact there's so much discussion as people talk about the Common Core, there's so much discussion about text complexity, oh yes, and close reading, and diving deep into all of these kinds of rich content and so forth that sometimes people think, OK, so where are the foundational skills? Have we decided they're not an important part, really, of what we're doing in literacy because we're spending so much attention and time and discussion on these other features? Well, I'm here to tell you that the position of California's framework is that the acquisition of foundational skills is crucial. That remains a critical part of what we do to support children in achieving those long-term goals that were on that outer ring. Right? California remains firm that the acquisition, the children's acquisition of foundational skills is crucial. That is not a change. It also makes clear that the purpose of acquisition is to en enable rich, meaningful engagement as readers and writers with print. Furthermore, this must be obvious to learners, right? So that foundational skills, oh, yay, I learned how to decode this. Oh, yes, I know all these interesting digraphs and diphthongs and blah, blah, blah. That's important, but kids need to get that it's for a reason, right? And so this, I will tell you, is going to be a change in some places, maybe not where you are. Maybe not where you are, but there have been some places that have been so focused on that that this was lost. The why of it was lost. The value of it. So the kids did not see the value of it. Kids must know that there is a reason that we're learning all of those things. And that reason is richly connected to who I am and what I want and what I want to learn and what I want to express. Here's some more aspects of uh, California's position on the foundational skills, the framework's position. And that is that instruction should be thoughtfully sequenced and implemented. In other words, it is not haphazard. It is not, well, today I think I'll deal with blends. Woohoo! Right? Because there's a flower blooming. So I'm going to deal with the FL blend. Now, do we ever make those kinds of connections? Yes, because we are responsive. But in fact, the foundational skills must be carefully sequenced. They go from less complex to more complex. And so the, the framework is asserting very clearly, and our publishers certainly have this message, that there needs to be the systematic sequence of from the easier to handle to the more complex. Because English is, in fact, a complex orthography. Right? And we know that research has much to offer on this, and so we tapped into that research. That then further, another position is that instruction should address the needs of individuals. And so therefore, we must differentiate. If you come into kindergarten already knowing the alphabet, and you get to do a letter a week for all of your kindergarten year, that's a problem. 
That's not differentiation. If you come into first grade already reading multisyllabic words, and you get to sit in a classroom with a teacher who's teaching how to sound and blend CVC words, that's a problem. So this framework asserts very clearly we've got to be addressing the needs of kids. And so therefore, differentiation is a must. The implication being you can't teach foundational skills to the whole 30 of your students and be expecting to be meeting needs. Right? And that theme's gonna come up again and again and again as we talk this afternoon. That there must be a system, and multiple systems of support available to kids. If we're going to address the needs of kids, this can't be Renee, who's the first grade teacher, doing it all on her own. There's got to be some support, some systems, and so all you reading specialists and literacy specialists and all of you people who play those kinds of roles, that's you. All you administrators getting, getting those systems set up so that Renee can do her job in supporting the learning of all those kids. That formative assessment is critical, so we need teachers who are skilled in formative assessment, so that chapter eight is gonna be really important in the framework, how to do formative assessment, what it looks like. And finally, a fifth, so I'm saying here's the positions of the framework on the foundational skills. They're crucial, they're for a reason, that must be obvious to kids. It should be thoughtfully and sequentially implemented. It should address the needs of individuals. And finally, that the other key things must also be addressed. In other words, teaching the foundational skills cannot be done to the exclusion of those other key themes, meaning making effective expression, language development, and content knowledge. In other words, the kindergarten, the first grade, the second grade teacher cannot fill their day exclusively doing foundational skills, as important as those are, <laughs> right? You cannot possibly do that. That is to poorly serve students, especially down the road when we realize that things like content knowledge and vocabulary and other language are such heavy hitters in progress and success in literacy. Hallie, so, yes. I think that does, it is an exceptionally big disservice to our EL students because they learn that reading is nothing more than decoding a set of sounds and that you're not supposed to make meaning out of things. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's really a key point. And in fact, speaking of English learners and foundational skills, there are a couple other key points that we need to say from the get-go before we get into some of the details. That the framework focuses on foundational skills in English. In other words, we don't talk about the foundational skills if you are learning to literacy in Chinese. We don't talk about it if you're learning literacy in Vietnamese. We don't talk about it if you're learning literacy in Spanish. There are, or in ASL, right? There are documents that are being developed about what do foundational skills look like in each of those other languages, in many other languages, right? But this framework is what are the foundational skills in English and how do we support those? More on that? So even though it's about foundational skills in English, it's important to know that research is showing that those same foundational skills actually hold true across a lot of languages, particularly alphabetic orthographies, right? Other languages that use an alphabet as their printed system. So when we talk about phonological awareness, and you have a child who is learning to read or has learned to read in Spanish, many of the same principles apply because that is an alphabetic system. Right. That English learners need support if they're learning the foundational skills in English. What do we need to think about? We need to think about their previous literacy experiences. Right. I'm not just popping you into this class of 25 kids and teaching you without being aware of what your previous literacy experiences were in your primary language. There is a difference if you already know how to read in your primary language and now you're coming over and you're learning English than if you are not someone who has had literacy experiences in your primary language and are now learning it in English, right? That oral language proficiency in the primary language will impact that how closely your primary language is related to English must be considered. 
if you use the same kind of alphabet, that is different than if you use a, a morphemic symbol system or a syllabary. That the type of writing system used uh, matters. So all of those things that we, we have English learners in our class and we're teaching them English foundational skills, although in dual language programs, yay, they're learning it in another language as well, right? But the type, all of these things must be considered and in fact, we can synthesize those down to three key things that people should be thinking about as they work with English learners. How you build on the skills and knowledge that students have from their primary language. That you are sensitive to pronunciation differences due to the influences of primary language, home dialect, or regional accent. Right? And you should not necessarily assume that they suggested decoding difficulty and that you, as Kristen was saying, ensure attention to meaning making. So when we are decoding words, they're not just nonsense words. There is a connection to something meaningful. And so that is going to be crucial as we move along. So that's just kind of the big picture, the position, the direction that we're going. And Kristen is going to start sharing some information about those, those four sets of foundational skills. And I'm going to apologize up front. I am recovering from a cold. So if you hear a nice loud cough through the mic, <laughs> I'm going to just apologize right, ahe right ahead. Foundational skills have four main strands, four different types of skills within them. There's print concepts. How do you hold a book? Do you read from left to right, top to bottom, those kinds of things. Phonological awareness, phonics and word recognition, and fluency. And we're going to talk a little bit about each of these four strands. So what you need to know about print concepts, it's very, very similar to what was in the previous standards with a slight change in the name. You have organization, that's like I was saying, top to bottom, front to back, left to right, and then you have your alphabet knowledge. One thing uh, that Hallie was talking about that's really key is differentiation. It's going to come up in another slide, and I'll let you know we do need to be teaching what our, what our students need to know. It's a disservice to them to put them in a classroom where they're hearing the same things they already, need, they already know how to do or they're not getting the extra practice that they need. So from the outset, while you're hearing about these things, I want you to be thinking about teaching this in a differentiated manner. It's a big shift that's part of these standards. It's a big shift that has in this framework. So I know a lot, of the, a lot of the experiences we've had teaching foundational skills. You've got maybe your whole group of little ones on the carpet in front of you, and you've got a nice big book that you're looking at if you're a primary teacher. There's a lot of what happens now that we need to be meeting students' individual needs. So I want you to try and kind of make that shift and think about doing this smaller group, differentiated with students, as you're looking at what composes these different strands. So we have the basic organization, and then we have alphabet knowledge, upper, lowercase letters, not the sounds. When we're talking about print concepts, we're talking about the letters. We're talking about names. Once you start talking about sounds that letters make, you've moved into phonics. And we're talking about just the print concepts here. How this is a B, this is a D, this is a P. It all depends on which direction you spin the thing and ends and use and all those other things kids get very mixed up on. So we do have some basic guidelines by grade level. And I want you to be thinking about that differentiation thing that I mentioned. You can't skip students ahead and over things they don't know. You want to make sure that they're learning things to mastery. So this is what first graders should be working on. But again, if they don't have those kindergarten standards met yet, that's first things first. If they can already do this, move them right along. Don't make them do it all over again. So first grade, they should be able to recognize features of a sentence, first word, last word, capitalizations, periods, correct punctuation. Instructional implications, I want you to think about this for a minute. When you're thinking about print concepts, shared reading and writing, and shared reading 
the text is very simple, repetitive, brown bear, brown bear, what did you see? I see a whatever it is looking at me, right? How is this different than reading aloud to students a challenging text and using some informational text to build comprehension? So if I'm reading brown bear, brown bear with students, I should have a very different purpose in mind than if I'm reading about the first Thanksgiving and how pilgrims came to America. Both may be a big book, both may be a picture book, but what I'm doing with those texts should be very different. So take just a moment, talk with someone sitting next to you. What is, how are, how are those two purposes different when you're looking at books? All right, can I uh, have any volunteers who'd like to share something out with the whole group? Any big ideas someone would like to share? Any ideas? Thank you. You thought that it was more a content versus structure, because you yeah. that the patterning is around your brain there, but like, um, the other text you would be looking more for the content. So you're going to be looking, right, you're going to be looking at content. Students need both. So as Holly was saying, you need to make sure that you're not teaching those foundational skills totally in isolation. You don't want students to be like, oh, I can rattle off all these different digraphs on flashcards. I'm done. I don't have to do anything else with them. You want to make sure they can do things in context. So with brown bear, brown bear, you're maybe tracking, pointing word to word. Could you also look at left to right, front to back of a book in a more challenging text? You could. Both of them have a place. So even if you're reading something that's more challenging, you can still reference some foundational skills. There's definitely a place for brown bear. Brown bear, don't think I'm saying there isn't. <laughs> but you don't have to use only those types of texts to help you teach some foundational skills. You can, get, you can be doing it in conjunction with some meaning making as well. So when it comes to the letter names, Adams suggests this. Uh, this continuum for teaching them. Letter names without print. Can you sing the alphabet? Can you just rattle them off? Uppercase printed letters, lowercase printed letters, the uppercase ones, they're not as similar with each other, more just nice straight lines. The lowercase ones, some of them look very similar, getting them mixed up, and then teaching letter sounds. They do not suggest trying to teach all four of these at the same time. I've had, as a reading specialist, I've had students come to me that their teachers say, this is A, and it says A, ah, and that's an A, and that's an A too. And the poor little kid's looking at me like, go. Oh, I don't know what an A is. You know? Or you ask them, what sound does this letter make? A, not A. Ah. You know, what do you hear in the word? I hear an A. No, I don't think you do. <laughs> I, so to make sure they have those concepts separate and straight in their heads. However, there is a time and a place for teaching all of these together. Think for a moment, when would it make sense to teach these one at a time? And when might it make sense to teach these all together? Any ideas? Think for just a minute. Any ideas about when you might want to throw all of those out to a student at once? As they get older? No, well, older or even like at the end of a, maybe it's, there's been a three week or five week study, you know, of some of these things individualized, <coughs> and then maybe at the end of that it's kind of a, on the fifth or sixth week or the third or fourth week, you know, you can pull it together when they've seen it kind of individualized. Okay. Whoa. Mm. Yeah, uh-huh. Their name has all of those components, right? So, and back here, uh-huh. Yes. I, I'm just um, thinking maybe writing, and they're writing, and they're trying to write, and they're as, student, as students are coming in, you want to make sure that they can do all of these things and know the difference between them. One time when you might want to teach them all together, and I'm, and I'm not talking about 
Um, I have some familiarity with these things, and then I'm going to do them all together. When you're introducing these things, you want to introduce them one at a time. One big exception would be if I have a student coming straight from Mexico who already knows how to read in Spanish and has kind of a knowledge of how an alphabetic system works, and they want to transfer that knowledge into English reading, they're going to be able to handle it's a letter name, it's an uppercase, it's a lowercase. Here's the sound that goes with it. They have those concepts already separated in their brain. When you have a student that's a young student coming in who has no experience about all of these things, and you want to teach them a song and an uppercase and a lowercase and a sound all at once, that might just get all jumbled up in there. So I really want you to consider taking those pieces and teaching them in isolation so they know the difference. When you start putting it in all at once and then you're asking them to do different things with what's the sound, what's the letter, and pulling all that out, um, it can be really confusing for some students. So really you'd want to teach them all together with a student who's got some background knowledge how things work. Now if you've got down to the end of the alphabet and you've taught you, if you're going marching along in order and you've got a couple letters maybe that aren't as common like W and Q and X, not that I have anything against those letters. They're just not as user friendly as M and S and T and F and all of those. So if you get down near the end and they already have that concept and they're using those, you might want to teach some of your letters you have remaining in this fashion. But when they're start, starting out with those skills, you want to make sure that you have these things in place. All right, I'm going to move on. Differentiation, you've heard me say it. You need to know what your students know. You need to teach what they don't know. You need to not spend all your time reviewing what they already do know. It's a big message of what we're saying today, is to differentiate this instruction. Phonological awareness is you're used to phonemic awareness. You've heard that term before. Phonological awareness, you're going to be playing with sounds and words. You're going to move from those larger units down to smaller ones. You're going to start with words, syllables, onsets and rhymes. And for those of you who are here who weren't too sure about onsets and rhymes, the onset is the first consonant sound. The rhyme is all the rest of the word that's left over. The phonemes are the individual sounds and words. So when you start, you're going to move one to the next. Because English is predominantly alphabetic, we have letter sounds. Um, readers in Spanish are most likely to grasp the logic and how this works together. It's a very similar process. Phonological awareness includes all of these different activities. And if there's any of these activities, we're going to try and save some question time at the end. And we've got a lot to cover before we can get to our activity. So if there's any of these, any of these uh, uh, that are listed here that you'd like to hear an example of, you're not sure what it is, put a little star next to it. And when we get to the question and answer, I'll demonstrate what each of these is referring to. So you want to demonstrate the understanding of spoken words, syllables, and sounds. You want to be able to isolate, pull a sound out. You want to blend sounds together. You want to be able to pull them apart. And there is a, a, there is a continuum of harder to difficult things to do here. California does add into the Common Core Standards to blend two and three phonemes into recognizable words for K, T, K, and K. And again, I'm going to skip through those grade level bands like we did on the other one. They're there for you to look at, but you want to know what your students know how to do. And the main goal of this is to be able to blend and segment those sounds to make words. So I'm going to pass it along. So let me just say we could do multi-day workshops on just print concepts, couldn't we? Yes. They are not that different from what California had in the past. We call them, instead of concepts about print, print concepts. But they're fundamentally the same. We do know increasingly more about how to teach the alphabet. 
some kids come to us already knowing that, right? So uh, almost a non-issue for us. But some kids, especially kids who are experiencing some difficulty, need somebody who gets it that by just simply knowing the alphabet song, you now have an anchor on which to hang capital letters, which are easier to perceive and differentiate than lowercase and so forth. So the idea is there is that knowledge. And again, we could spend a lot of time on that. Same thing with phonological awareness. Right? There's, and, and in those chapters, particularly chapter three, you'll see lots of advice. And we actually have some more in our handouts here in a minute. The next large category of those foundational skills is phonics and word recognition. And this is one that, again, is not that hugely different from the past. We get that it should be systematic. We get we should move from less complex to more complex. We get, and what really is emphasized much more this round, is that kids need to master those levels before they move on. It's not a spiral in terms of foundational skills. Oh, we know you didn't get this, but we're going to move on, and you know, eventually we'll come back to it for you. That, in fact, when you've moved on in most of those foundational skills, it's utterly confusing for kids. So the notion is really more that you need to get it before we move on. You need to get what short vowels are so you can construct those little words, the consonant vowel, consonant words that are hugely you know, cat, dog, fish, and so forth. And then we can move on into some of those long vowel combinations. And we can move on into this. And what happens in the standards and in the framework is you see that progression. And that assertion. So uh, let me go back to this one. In terms of phonics and word recognition, we talk in the framework about three rather big areas. One is simply the letter sound and spelling sound. Letter is the one-to-one -one correspondence. D represents the sound d. By the way, the letter D doesn't say d, right? D represents the sound d. Okay? That Spelling sound usually means more than one letter, and not usually it does. So SH is the spelling for SH. So it's interesting because in those standards, we talk about letter sound and spelling sound. Letter means the one letter that represents the sound. Spelling means any combination of letters that represent that sound. I think that can be a little confusing, but again, we make that clear in the framework. So that basic part that's happening with you TK first and kindergarten teachers, the multisyllabic words, this is called out more in the, in the Common Core Standards, is that getting kids to be able to read multisyllabic. We do know that a lot of kids can get through those initial stages, but they hit a wall when it comes now to reading some of these longer words. Need you to know that if you are pretty doggone solid with those little words, that it makes dealing with multisyllabic words much easier. Because now you begin to see the same patterns over and over again, patterns that you have developed quite a confidence in. right? Patterns that we know there are neurological pathways that are developed. The more you see something and process it, the more rapidly you access it in the future. And so now I'm going to deal with a polysyllabic word. Oh my goodness, there's this little word within that. There's this little word. But if I never built some real confidence and facility with those littler parts, that is going to create significant difficulties for me as I'm dealing with multisyllabic words. It genuinely is a very tough jump for many kids. And why is that? Because they never really developed that confidence and that skill with those smaller units that they were, deal that they were taught in the earlier grades. So in the framework, we talk about letter sound course and spelling sound correspondences. We talk about multisyllabic words and talk about how beneficial it is to get syllable patterns. How many of you are aware of the difference between open and closed syllables? OK, excellent. That's a <coughs> fundamental thing for kids to get. Right? In fact, I say to my college students, uh, so open, sorry, an open syllable ends in a vowel. Right? It's typically a long sound, typically. If you close that vowel, it changes to a short sound. Right? If you were to spell the word millennium, how would you spell it? If you're aware of this simple understanding, you're likely to do meh. Millennium, because I know I need to close this vowel. Because usually, if it's a single letter here, it goes with the next syllable. 
So if I wanted to close off this syllable, I had to double the letter. You want to write Hallie's name? This is what you hear, right? I put an IE. But spelled like this, usually in syllables, if it's a single consonant, it goes with the second syllable. So the initial syllable here is open, so it should be pronounced how? Haley. Haley, that's right. But because my mama named me Hallie, she had a second L in there, which actually I should have put on this side, right? So that closed this and made it a short sound. Tell me how you pronounce this comment, please. Sorry about that printing. How do you pronounce it? Nah, it's Halley's. Sir Edmund Halley, right? And you know that. Now, people spell things funky all the time, right? <laughs> I mean, they just say, I'm going to name my child Teresa, and they spell it X Y M, right? <laughs> OK, you have a right to do that. Go for it. But you're not using the alphabetic system <laughs> the way it was designed. So this is actually, and if you talk to many scientists, they will say it's Halley's Comet. And so, how do you spell millennium? Well, that's a short sound. I got to close it. Mill. How about the ennium? Eh, eh, eh. Is that an open vowel? Is that a long vowel or short vowel? So, guess what I have to do here? Double N. Double N. And then E M, right? So, just by whether you choose to double the L and double the N, it tells me. Well, one, some of you just get it intuitively. Guess what? A whole lot of kids get it intuitively. But some kids need that explicit attention on what it means. If we're going to read multisyllabic words, oh my goodness, we could do, I, I teach reading methods courses at the university. We could do days upon days upon days upon days as I work through how the code works and how you systematically build from less complex to more. The framework says that's what we need to be doing. The framework gives some examples of that. The framework tells the publishers those are the materials you must provide. So that you, as a kindergarten teacher, don't need to try to invent the entire curriculum yourself and know all of that. Okay? So it's the framework then also says, as we think about phonics and word recognition, based on what those foundational skills are in the common core, we're doing the top bullet. We're doing multisyllabic words. Thinking about how syllables work is actually quite handy. Thinking about morphemic units, right? When you see certain, when you see un at the beginning of many words, the first thing you should think of is, is that the unit that means not? Now, in some words, it's not under, right? But unable, unhappy. There are many times when it's very handy to know, and in fact, really helps students then unlock some of those longer words. And then finally, there are also sight words, because guess what? English is a y'all come language. We borrow words from many other languages. And so some of them come with spellings that don't match what we have done in the English alphabetic orthography. And so part of instruction in phonics and word recognition is looking at sight words. Here in the next several slides, I'm not going to read them to you, but we put them here as a way of saying, guess what? Here's what's addressed typically in K, typically in first, Typically in second, typically in third, that's the continuum. But if you have a child who has not mastered what's in first, you can't just march on. You are setting that child up for difficulties. And so that, that's what those next several slides are. Let me comment that the language standards are related, right? The language standards, especially the spelling standards, are related because you're decoding and encoding. I'm using this. Myself, so often those are taught not as a separate time of day. Oh, from 1 to 1.15, I do spelling. I got my list. They, mem they do a pretest on the list. They do a post-test on the list, and now we memorize it. Spelling is taught as a way of understanding how that code works. And so it works very nicely in conjunction with learning how to read those words, how to decode those words. By the way, I'll also add notice here. In the spelling, in the spelling strand, standards within the language strand, it also talks about morphemic units. And so guess what? Now it's also tied to the vocabulary standards. Right? So it's all very connected together. And then, of course, there's a sight word continuum, learning some sight words beginning in kindergarten. 
one of the comments that one of the ideas that we'd like to point out here is that in the kindergarten standards, it uses the term sight words. Children will learn some sight words, right? Common sight words. And then from every grade after that, that talks about sight words, it says irregularly spelled sight words. Why might that be? I hear you said it. Say it again. Yeah, they have not yet learned. It may very well be a regularly spelled word. Mom, that's a regularly spelled word. It follows the rules. But if you're in kindergarten and you have not yet been taught the sound symbol correspondences, for you, that's not a decodable word yet, right? So it is taught as a sight word to very quickly give you some access to words. But once we hit first grade, we're saying you need to be able to employ your decoding skills to access these words. And then that's why we call them irregularly spelled. And there's guidance on that. Again, I'm going to pass that out in a minute. Um, I'm going to move on into fluency very quickly. Fluency is different in the Common Core standards than it was in our old California ELA standards. Not because the spirit was different, but because, in fact, it is uh, more specificity is given and more connection to comprehension is given. So it's not just about rate and reading fluently through. It actually is saying that there are these three aspects you have to think about. Accuracy matters. The rate matters, which means you've developed automaticity. Right? Automaticity with the code and prosody, which means that you have that more natural kind of uh, set phrasing and expression. And so again, there's guidance regarding each one of those aspects, and that goes all the way up through the grade levels. We know that there is a link, by the way, between comprehension and fluency. And essentially, this slide is pointing out that there's no point in working on automaticity if you're not accurate, right? You have to develop accuracy first. And then we move towards enough exposures in enough different contexts that now you build the automaticity. Kids who have automaticity will be able to read and re comprehend much more readily because they've got the extra mental energy they can really devote to the whole purpose of this, and that's to make sense of things, right? So if it's slow and labored reading, even if you're accurate, you don't have the mental energy left over now to really make meaning with it. So let's move on. Um, again, some of these are what you can look at. There's some quotes that we're actually going to distribute to you in just a moment. So here were some more of those fluency standards. I'd like to, um, I'll come back to this. I'd like to suggest now that we look at handout one, which Kristen is about to distribute. Let me tell you something first. There are six pieces in handout one. So a couple of them are two pagers. What I'd like to do is have you share them with the people next to you, but you're going to talk to those people in a minute. So it's probably easier to share behind you than all the way down the row. So you, f you figure it out. We're all adults in here. Six pieces, six selections in this handout. It might be two pages long, so check on that. And will you just read silently, take a few notes, highlight something if you have a highlighter. And we're only going to give you a couple minutes so we know that you won't get through it all, but just start diving into it. These are select excerpts from the framework. The more theoretical research aspect, broad guidelines, soon the very practical. Thank you. As you can see, this is complex material. You're hoping that all new teachers who come into the field have been in credential programs where they've learned some of this. You're hoping that your staffs, your kindergarten, first grade, second grade teachers get this, but guess what? Your third, fourth, and fifth also will need to get this. You also know that some people at secondary school, some of the educators at the secondary school, need to have a pretty solid grounding in how this works. So these were some theoretical broad bro or broad suggestions here. And what I'd like to tell you is you know that uh, site, that bit site that Kristen corrected for you? All of the handouts, so if you didn't get to see all of these, all of these are on that site. So you can see what your peers were reading and so forth. And of course, you can always find them in the framework should you cho choose to. But the idea is if you're thinking about foundational skills, these are some of the, some, only a handful 
of the particular uh, resources within that framework to support you in thinking about this and extending your knowledge or those with whom you work, the, the knowledge of those with whom we work. That was handout one. Handout two is very practical suggestions. Here's what a teacher might do who's teaching this. So that's about to come your way. You will not be getting up and talking with others around the room, but you will be sharing very quickly with others near you. So you have And the numbers up here, the handout two, a lot of these are two pagers. So if one and two go together, that's the same. So if you get page one, make sure you get page two. Three is by itself. Four and five go together. Six and seven go together. Eight's by itself. Nine's by itself. So when you're taking copies of these, please make sure that if you get one of these three that you're taking both pages. Or you're going to start in the middle of a sentence or you're going to think, what on earth were they talking about? What happened in the beginning of that one? Thank you for all the conversation. All that was a teaser for what you might find, what you will find in the framework. And just as I commented on the previous set of handouts, these two are on that site so that you can find these if you'd like. In a, just a moment, any call out, idea, notion, uh, reaction to what you just now read? Really good, thank you. <laughs> any, anything, thank you, I appreciate that because I cried a lot of 2 a.m. nights working. I was really simplistic about um, you know, doing word sorts, and it's, I said it's almost like the down and dirty of phonics. Like, here's just some really simple steps you could be doing with your kids to help them with a certain, you know, like compound words, and we were looking at inflectional endings. Very yeah, cool. Good. Thank you. I just want to add to that. I had the same one. It, it, you did show us these ones. You start off with words that Spell, and then go to the taking and then drop it in. So it's really good. Thank you. Any other reaction? Focus on meaning. Thank you. And especially with the ELs, who you're teaching decoding in English, you've got to make sure that, that a connection with meaning is made. But you also, as you read in the handout one, that memory trace between the orthographic or the visual, right? The phonological or what it sounds like and the semantic, the meaning that those all need to be tied so that when you see a word, when you hear the word finish, orally spoken, we all you know, access meaning right away that you access that also in print. So very cool. I, what I'd like to think is some of you said, oh, this is a practice that I have done, yeah. right? Because there is much of value that we have been doing. So it's that notion of keeping it in this perspective thinking about the systematic progression, thinking about the student engagement with it, thinking about why we're doing it, thinking about the connection with meaning and getting to apply it very quickly into connected kind of text. There's so much more that we could discuss. There's a lot in the framework, but there's just so much more. Let's spend the last two minutes, one minute, if you have any burning question. Yeah, so I had a question in regards to the handout from the, se the last discussion that we had when we were divided up into groups. Uh, handout one, sorry, page one, and where it's mentioned that, uh, it says assuring that by mid first grade children know how to decode newly regular, new regularly spelled one syllable words. So if they're ELs and they're in a, say a dual language immersion program, I mean, what do you, is there an adjusted timeline? That's kind of what I'm interested in. And uh, let's say this right off the bat. One is California values and makes it clear in this framework that learning a second language and becoming literate in a second or third language is really a powerfully important thing. I would tell you very quickly in terms of dual language, one must sit down with whoever is creating that curriculum and say, Where's the overlap? What do we already know? What are we emphasizing first? What are we emphasizing second uh, in terms of languages? Is there co-development of that? So I'm, I would have to tell you, it depends on how you choose to lay that out. Some programs spend a lot more time developing literacy in one language and then sweep in the next language. Some of them are doing more co-development, so it depends on the dual language model that you're using. Uh, so that's the best I can do. And we're now in negative time. So could we take your comment and then yours or question? Yes, Eve. It was just a quick 
question. At the very beginning, we talked about recognizing and naming letters, and it gave an order for suggested instruction and not to do all four at once. So what we have happening in some of our sites is at different times of the day, they are doing different parts of this. So they're doing handwriting without tears, where they're learning letter name and shape. Then they're doing maybe HM phonics or foreknowledge phonics, where they're doing letter sounds. Is that different letters, different sounds, different names? Yeah, I would say, how successful are your students being? Because that's the real indicator. And I tell you that the research shows that t generally, if they don't know any of those things, it's too complex to be learning all of those things concurrently. Because each one, once you learn it, becomes an anchor point by which the next thing is learned more readily. And so, uh, you know, again, if you have students who came from preschools and homes in which they had lots of rich experiences, so this is, or TKs, if this is not brand new, as you all mentioned earlier, you may be able to do a lot of that. If the symbols are new for these kids, they don't know the names, they don't know the shapes, they don't, can't identify them, to do all of that concurrently is generally, what we find in the research, problematic for kids. So you tell me, you tell yourself, who those kids are, what kind of success are we having with this? And you will find that the kids, there are some kids, those kids who are likely to struggle, that will become the less explicit, systematic, carefully sequenced route if you're doing it all at once. If their kids are struggling, you've got to go back and think about how you're laying that out. And lastly, just the difference between the foundational skills and the ELD standards and the foundational skills and the ELD are already framework. Uh, basically, in the ELD standards, they're referring back to the foundational skills here, but they actually say foundational literacy skills, so they kind of have some broader additional things that are going on in there. One of these handouts had a chart that was sort of matching up some of that, so. so let me say you do have a final handout, and that is the, what we've put in the white paper is what are considered the most important uh, decoding, word recognition, foundational skills per grade level, assuming kids are moving along the continuum. And we also provided the preschool learning foundations that are relative to that, because if you teach TK or have a TK, you're going to spring off of that and move on. And then finally, there is a conclusion that is, comes from that white paper that kind of sums up this and keeps it in that perspective we hope that you will read. So that's, uh, we need to let you go to your break and then move on to your last session. Thank you for being here.